Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lake Stevens Chamber of Commerce April Chamber Luncheon. Uh, today, I'm excited for our speaker, Jerry Cornfield from the Everett Herald is with us to talk about all the, all the legislative happenings from this year's session, uh, which is rapidly drawing to a close. Uh, we'll get to that in a second, but first, a couple of announcements. To begin with, just a reminder of our mission here at the Greater Lake Stevens Chamber of Commerce. Uh, let's do it all the way. Um, to build a vibrant business community. Uh, today's speaker is a direct result of some of the efforts that we have been making to become the Chamber Lake Stevens needs to, add, to advance our mission. Better, a better legislative understanding and connection will help the, the Lake Stevens business community be prepared for and involved in the government affairs that we must all live by with a voice in how things evolve. We are also continuing uh, to prepare for our 4th of July event in downtown uh, and our sponsorship opportunities will be announced soon. So keep an eye out for those. And that will give you an opportunity to connect uh, with our community in new ways. And we're excited to be welcoming new businesses to town, even in the stressful economic times. Opportunities for you to become involved in your chamber are open now. If you're interested, please reach out to me at my email director at lakestevenschamber.com or give me a call here at the office. Next up, we want to thank our, uh, take a moment and thank our gold investors for 2021. First up, Ace Hardware of Lake Stevens and our other gold investor at this time, Community Transit. Thank you to them, as well as our silver investors, Waste Management, uh, Wells Fargo and Heritage Bank, as well as First Financial Northwest Bank, and our newest silver investor just joining both the ranks of uh, silver investors and the chamber this month, Marysville Toyota. So, we want to welcome them on board. We want to thank all of you for continuing to support the chamber. We appreciate it here. A couple of event reminders coming up for you. Uh, next week uh, is our monthly networking after hours on the Zoom platform. We will be on Zoom from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, Wednesday, April 20th. This is an opportunity to meet leaders of the Lake Stevens business community in a relaxed atmosphere. We will also be announcing an exciting travel opportunity for you and the community at Networking After Hours. So grab your favorite after work beverage and join us. We'd love to have you. The following Tuesday, excuse me, uh, join us for Morning Mingle. Uh, this is an informal drop by for a quick chat to get your day started sort of an event happening on Tuesday, April 27th this month from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. via Zoom. We hope you'll join us for one or both of these uh, networking events. We often see uh, uh, quite a, a great, just some great people stop by, uh, including people, uh, we have city council members stop by, the mayor stop by on occasion, uh, obviously many business leaders stop by, so uh, do plan to join us if you're available. We'd love to have you on board. Well, that's enough of my yak, and let's get to, let me introduce our speaker here. Uh, Jerry Cornfield is the political and legislative reporter for the Everett Herald. He writes a weekly political column for the Herald, and while the legislature's in session, a daily rundown of the goings-on in Olympia called the Cornfield Report with the slogan, Your Ear in Olympia. I'm excited to welcome, uh, directly from a committee hearing just before us, uh, Jerry Cornfield. Thank you, Jerry, for uh, joining us today. We appreciate you being here. Well, thank you very much. I have to start by unmuting something I've learned to do quite a bit in this a legislative session. I don't think I've looked that happy uh, for a while uh, dealing with these lawmakers. Uh, but thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, um, over the next few minutes, I'll uh, share what I can about what's happening and what's left to happen. Uh, feel free to um, jump in if there's questions as we go along. I, I recognize a couple of names, uh, and folks probably won't be hesitant to interrupt and it won't bother me um, as we go through that uh, just a little background I arrived here from California in February 2004 and I've been covering the legislature since then um, but I'm not a complete California transplant uh, my mom's a native of Aberdeen and our dad was an optometrist my grandfather was an optometrist in Aberdeen and my mom and aunt both went through the uh, UW graduated from there and I've got relatives you know, scattered all across the Northwest now. I 
happened in this state, uh, Squim and Seattle and Whidbey Island, Bellevue, and uh, you know, so they're all over. So there, there's some, there was Northwest roots. So in California, where I was working in Santa Barbara, but uh, when that <laughs> was not able to be, uh, when I was not employed there any longer, <laughs> I went looking for work and I landed in the Northwest. So. Um, we can we can tell you're not a good say swim for it. Uh, when, I'm the, go ahead and correct. I'm trying to figure out how to say all these communities correctly, but uh, yeah, they don't teach me. Not even my relatives. They don't correct me. So, uh, but um, yeah. So it, I have been and I live down in I live here in Olympia and I've been covering the legislature full time. Uh, and covering elections and politics, but since I've moved up here. And uh, this session is gonna stand out for everybody and probably this past year is gonna obviously be historic for everybody in many ways. Uh, just a kind of a, a recap, it was March of last year when they finished up, uh, we all know that COVID had already arrived in Snohomish County and it was, you, you could sense in the final days of the 2020 session this anxiety of, you know, can we get done and, and finish our work as a legislature without anybody getting sick, without uh, COVID you know, shutting us down as a, you know, as a legislative process? Because back then, you know, everything was open, all the meetings were going on, it was, if you will, normal, and they did get done. And then days later, the schools were closed and uh, businesses were shut down and, and restrictions came. So, uh, they beat, if you will, uh, COVID to get out of town. And then they arrived back in January 11th. And boy, did they, so much has occurred in the state and in the nation. And it really set the tone for what we're talking about in the legislature this year. But you know, I don't think I need to remind everyone about uh, which way COVID went. But uh, for lawmakers in June, they were being told the economy was in the dumpers and uh, they could expect huge deficits that they're going to have to deal with. Um, they hadn't even realized what the death of George Floyd was going to mean. And then comes November with uh, the elections and the elections shook things up both in Washington DC, which for the majority Democrats in the House and Senate, um, they were quite happy. And uh, they have uh, a lot of visions of what would happen. Um, but they also saw more Democrats elected into the House. And while there's the same number of Democrats in the Senate, uh, it's a different makeup. There is a more uh, left of center. I, I use the word progressive when it comes to the House. In the Senate, there is essentially one fewer moderates and one more uh, liberal, which, you know, that makes a big difference of what's happened uh, in what has been the first 94 days of session. And the other things that have happened, as we know, is Two stimulus packages um, have uh, really helped keep the economy of Washington going, and the economy is way ahead now of what they anticipated. Uh, their projections are that they, even if there was no uh, federal aid, there was going to be more tax collections, and they expect more tax collections to come in from the economy. Uh, you know, if they didn't receive any direct aid from the federal government, but they have. Um, and these are some big numbers. I mean, just between the two packages last year and the one that President Biden signed, you know, the state is looking at you know, somewhere between five, six, seven billion dollars, some of which they've already allocated and spent and much more that they haven't. The schools around the state, there's at this point, there's probably about two and a half billion dollars sitting in a pot to be distributed over the next three years. And then and there's many money, there's money, the cities and counties are waiting uh, for tens of millions of dollars uh, that they're waiting for the feds to tell them. And all of this plays into the conversation down here. So, I mean, I, uh, we've reported, but I tell you, there's so much information out there. Um, I, I, I can't even imagine folks can keep track, but it always stuns me that, you know, numbers like $21 million are going to come to the city of Everett from this most recent COVID package. Um, you know, they're talking, I think it's 20, if I'm right, 25 million to the Everett School District. I look at those first because they're the biggest city, but there's millions of dollars coming to everywhere. Uh, and 
So that's going to really, that affects the conversations down here because when they have, <laughs> they've got majorities and they have a lot of money, uh, they want to spend it and they're trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, so looking at, the, so, what it, so they arrive and they suddenly they have money they didn't expect. The majority party has majorities that they'd hoped for and they have a democratic president. So the Democrats are pretty happy and pretty ambitious about what they want to do. And Republicans arrive not so much depressed about their numbers, but more concerned about the landscape. And you know, they, if you didn't take, you know, for eight months, they had been sort of talking about, hey, the governor's been running the state by himself. He's been making decisions with some input from the Democratic and Senate leaders, but not much. And one of their goals had been to let's rewrite the balance of power um, with the governor and the legislature so we can have a say if there's a second year of the pandemic, which there is, and maybe another kind of health care or any kind of emergency. Uh, it, it is, um, as a reporter, it's odd to have spent the last eight months and just get press releases from the governor saying, you know, we have an eviction moratorium. Now we've extended the eviction moratorium. We have this program, we have that program, all happening uh, without the legislature directly and publicly involved. So that was where the Republicans arrived this year. One of their main goals was to, to change or discuss that issue. So we've had 94 days. There's this day and 11 more to go. They're supposed to adjourn on the 25th of April uh, by midnight. I would say that there's a good chance. I mean, they will adjourn as they have to, but I'm not convinced that uh, yet that they'll be finished with all their work. I think special session is uh, a possibility. Um, but what they've done, and I'm just going to run through a few. It, it's let me back up a step. I think a word I'll be using, uh, a word a lot of commentators and folks will be using when the session is over is they'll use words like historic and meaningful, uh, you know, ambitious. It won't be considered prolific because there aren't as many bills in total numbers, but uh, this is a very impactful session. Uh, there is, I, I'm not, I, I dare say that there won't really be an individual or a family who won't be directly or indirectly, uh, I mean, it won't be impacted in some way by what they are doing this year as a legislature and in concert with the governor. Some of those impacts won't be felt right away and some will, um, but if you think about our day-to-day -day lives, they really are touching all of the bases. Um, so they're gonna have three budgets, right? Every This is their time where they have to do two-year budgets. So then, um, and those will be done. And the transportation budget itself will just keep things running. So that won't be very much. Uh, it won't be big news there. The capital budget is the goodies budget. And that's where a lot of organizations, nonprofits, cities, communities are looking to get that you know, $50,000 grant here, $300,000 grant there um, to whether it's provide affordable housing or put a roof on a senior center or clean up an estuary, any of those kinds of things. They are <clears throat> putting a chunk of money there. Um, broadband is an area where they're going to spend $400 million in this area to try to expand broadband, and it's likely it'll end up in the capital budget. I mean, that, that's an unheard of number for this legislature and this state in one fell swoop. Uh, it won't be spent all at once, but just putting it there is uh, the kind of thing they've never been able to do and they will be able to do. So the capital budget is going to have money in it that it hasn't seen before. It's going to have some expenditures that are going to be large, uh, especially in the area of housing. Um, and then the operating budget is going to look, um, you know, it's, it's going to be, when you add in the federal dollars, I, it may be the largest that this state will have for many years to come. Now, they don't count the federal dollars in their total money, but, you know, they, they are dealing with the regular state budget, which big numbers, two years, probably 58 billion but then they're gonna have tacking on, like I say, five to six billion more dollars that they're gonna spend. And so you're going to, if you, you know, if your childcare is an issue, 
they are increasing slots and putting in hundreds of millions of dollars. The, the Fed sent them $350 million alone, which it's a huge number and it's it just it allows them to add hundreds of slots for the next couple of years and to also provide money for childcare providers. Um, so they, you know, that's a target. If you are looking to uh, like City of Everett to do some rapid housing, they're putting you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into housing programs. They're putting almost a billion dollars into helping those, uh, and I guess when it's all done, it'll be over a billion, who right now are renters, who can't be evicted due to the moratorium and they haven't been paying some or all of their rent for the past year. There's money there theoretically to help the landlords uh, make up for those losses. Um, and, and those are big, that's a big sum of money. So the operating budget is going to have um, some huge investments. And then there's some things that we, again, it, it, I won't feel it, I won't see it, but I know it's impactful. Uh, eight, they're talking about putting hundreds of million dollars into the teacher's retirement system. And what that means is they pick a, they make a big check right now, a down payment on future debts. And so going forward, they won't have to make those payments. It's kind of like paying off your loan early is what they're hoping to do. And that's a big deal for retired teachers or teachers who become retired. It also helps the budget going down forward. So the operating budget is going to have a lot of numbers that are going to could have uh, programs uh, across the board. Uh, I, I can't even keep track yet. I know there's, there's, there's all these sites online that you know compare and contrast, but we'll have it, it'll come out on Monday. I'm guessing Monday or Tuesday, and and they should get it all finished by Sunday. But the policy bills that are being talked about and the policy changes that are going to come, again, I mentioned broadband, uh, things like not only is there money, but they're talking about letting public utilities get into the business of providing a broadband service. Cities and counties get in the business. They're still negotiating that. Uh, you know, there are rules for early childhood education. They want to expand the list. There's, um, I'm trying to think of the, the, these are the biggest ones that really focused on the families and in housing and then the services of like the broadband. But the other big issues, um, and, and I don't want to get caught up in there, uh, the, the language of the legislature where, you know, everything's looked through a certain lens of some sort, but police accountability and I think we'll have a story online right now that's updating it, but there has been a lot of attention to police accountability. And I know that that covers the whole gamut. So I'll give you an idea, there's 11 pieces of legislation that will probably get signed. Some of it is simple. Let's just, if you can, you know, I wasn't aware, they don't track incidents of the use of force. So you've got 39 counties, the sheriff's department, they get the information Police departments have information now that we require to keep it in one place statewide. So going forward, probably for in a year from now, we might be able to go online and see how many use of force incidents were there in Washington. But more direct to what's on the street, they're changing the uh, rules of engagement between law enforcement and the public. Uh, you know, no more chokeholds, neck restraints. This state doesn't really issue a lot of the no-knock warrants. What what led to the tragic killing of Breonna Taylor. Um, but now we'll have it in legislation, they can't do it. Uh, that's the way that you know, those bills are going. Um, now, the, that same bill at one point avoided, it eliminated the use of uh, dogs in pursuits and it, it changed the rules for vehicle pursuits. Those were uh, modified through the process. So the, you'll still see some canine units, but um, they're going to need. There's going to be some new training and model going on, and you'll see. You'll still see some vehicle pursuits, but they're not supposed to happen as often. So while they may be able to, you know, chase down a DUI driver who's speeding along the highway if they think that car is, you know, endangering the lives of others. But if it's three in the morning and it's the only car on the highway, the theory is they won't pursue that vehicle. Um, because there's no one else's life um, being put at risk. So those are the kinds of changes. Uh, they are going to create an independent investigative team uh, that will statewide, they'll be able to look at cases. So police accountability has been one of their targets um, for policies. And I, I would say that's probably one of the major sort of overarching policies that they've tried to deal with. 
um, another topic. It's not so much a policy view, but it, it's to it all is taxes. Um, it, we're at a stage where it's almost, it, where it, there was a whole bunch on the table and now the number's coming down, but there's going to be taxes uh, that will be passed and where and and, and fees. I mean, I, I think taxes and fees are about the same. It just depends on where you pay for them. I mean, I, I, there's one, the document recording fee, which I don't think I've ever recorded a document, but I'm sure someone did on my behalf or something. They're going to add a hundred dollars to that fee, and uh, that's going to raise, you know, almost three hundred million dollars for housing programs. So that's uh, going to show up somewhere. Uh, they are talking. They are going to pass a capital gains tax. I, I don't want to presume who's made big profits, but you'd have to make a pretty good, you know, capital gains to pay that. It'll end up in court, so it won't. Well, but they are going to pass that tax. Um, they have got, um, you know, it looks likely if they get a transportation package, there will be an increase in the gas tax. Um, that's another one that folks are going for or are, are talking about. And um, then there'll be a whole bunch. I mean, if there's transportation, there'll be a whole bunch of small ones. The taxes are surprising that they'd be discussed. And uh, I think that's one of the arguments Republicans have been raising of, with all this money, why do we need to get more? I think Democrats are looking ahead saying we're expanding programs now. We've got to pay for them later. So that's what they're working on. Um, there is, there really are four really big issues though that are left and to be discussed. But uh, before I do that, just, I should mention that they have already have a number of bills being signed today. And like this hour, the governor signing a bill that will, and then, We'll do things that uh, people might have, be interested in. Uh, if you've been to Washington, D.C., there's a, every state has a statue there in the U.S. Capitol. I think it's called a Statuary Hall. And there's one been one there for a while, Marcus Whitman. Well, in a few years, it'll be replaced by one of uh, Billy Frank Jr., the Native American leader. There's a bill being signed now. Uh, starting in, uh, I have to remember now, I think it's 2023, there'll be a New state a legal holiday Juneteenth uh, will become a legal holiday, so there'll be at least for state employees they'll get the day off. Uh, private sector will have to decide how they want to handle that. So there, you know, there are some issues like that that are going on. But the big questions that remain, uh, as I mentioned, the transportation package, and that's sort of inextricably linked with uh, two climate change bills that are you know, just so weighty and complicated to try to explain, but uh, and, I, and I, I can't even understand all the details, but cap and trade, low carbon fuel standard, trust me, they, are, they will add, if they all get passed, they will do something to the price of gas uh, at some point <laughs> in your future. I just don't want to know about that. And then the other one that, um, is there and what could drive them into special session. You might recall in February, the Supreme Court, state Supreme Court issued a ruling that it was no longer, it could no longer be a crime to possess drugs. So the state had a law and they invalidated this law that made it a felony to just simply possess the drugs. Um, and so now there have been hundreds of cases uh, dismissed, the people are let out of jail and the lawmakers are trying to figure out how to respond to that. Uh, some want to reinstate penalties, some don't. Some are using it as a way to increase treatment programs, which you know, it's a, there's money from the federal government as well as the state to increase treatment. Uh, so those negotiations are hard, made a lot harder by this virtual network, you know, where they could used to sit in a room and talk and hash things out. Now they have to do it over the computers and it's just not as effective. I don't think it's quite as e efficient, if you will, to get done. But trying to decide on what climate change bills, trying to reach agreement on a transportation package, and trying to figure out what to do with what's called the Blake decision, those are really, I think, the uh, end of session fights and maybe push them into special session. Um, I'll just, uh, one last thing I'll just wrap with is that the one thing that won't occur and the Republicans aren't happy about is it does not look like the majority Democrats want to do anything to uh, change the emergency powers of the governor. And 
Um, that's disappointing to them. They're trying, they're gonna try various maneuvers over the next 11 days on the floors of the House and maybe Senate to try to draw it out. But um, they feel the legislature majority of parties have ceded too much power to the governor. And before they leave on April 25th, they, they, know, they will keep trying to change that dynamic. Otherwise, there will be potentially billions of dollars that will come and the governor will get the first crack at how to spend them. And the full legislature won't get any crack at it. So um, that's the issue. So um, really, I don't think, I think I'll stop there because I don't, I mean, there's a lot of bills, but it also, <laughs> um, I feel like I just did a committee hearing here. So I will stop. I don't know if there were questions or Matt, have you had some um, that uh, I forewarned you that you wanted to draw up? <laughs> feel free. Uh, Happy to take any questions. You. From anybody. Uh, just kind of, you know, raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you. If you anybody's got anything they want to ask, uh, any specific legislation or something that you, maybe you heard about that you want to maybe an, an update on, we'd love that we could ask, uh, ask Jerry here. Um, any, anybody got any questions or any, anything for Jerry? I'm sure a committee chair would be very happy when they know any questions. <laughs> Monica. <laughs> no, I have a question, but I just find it very interesting to all that information that you have and that you have the insight on what's going on. Because I feel like some of the stuff just comes through social media and you get a little here and you get a little there. So to get a little overview is really interesting. Well, thank you. It's uh, I, I have to say just as a reporter, I've been in this business way too long, but it's this is one of the odder sessions because you know what we're doing right now um i don't even get this with the uh, lawmakers most days other than their press conferences you know to talk to a lawmaker you do it on the phone and for us who uh, work at the capitol we're much more successful and i actually think the media coverage in some ways is probably more complete when they're we can walk down the hallway and bump into a lawmaker or we can go into a meeting i mean if anyone who's gone to a legislative session, you know you can pass a note and a lawmaker may actually leave and come down and talk to you in the hallway. And, uh, those opportunities are lost. And any, I think most folks would say that this law, uh, not just here, but just in our, at large, whether it's schools or business, whatever it is, if you, you lose that face-to-face -face contact, that means something gets lost in translation. We've had one, interesting, controversial, lost in translation moment. There's a huge bill that's gonna get signed, a, a huge from a, a political standpoint. Uh, you know, this state is an open carry state, but uh, given what's happened in the tens times of 2020, what happened on January 6th in the nation's capital, there, there's a bill that's going to ban the open carry of weapons at the state capital and at rallies uh, and, the the bill was moving along and an amendment was added for an emergency clause that'll take effect right away and there won't be able to be a vote by the people. And it turned out that uh, no one asked for it. The lawmaker said it was a state patrol. State patrol said, no, I didn't say that. Then when the tra uh, reporter traced it back, it was like a conversation that somebody thought they heard on Zoom from one of their colleagues. So then they asked, it, it, it just happened and nobody wanted it to, and nobody could undo it. So, and that's clearly because of this virtual reality that we're in right now, so. Did I see you had a, had, might have a question there? I just wanted to know, I mean, there's a lot going on with the pandemic and money, and but there's also a lot of good things I know that go on during this time. So what is your favorite bill or the bill that you are most excited that was passed? Oh, picking a favorite, you know, the one bill I thought would actually pass and it didn't was the naming of a state dinosaur. Um, I mean, they've the last couple of years, they've had a major effort. Some kids, I think they were in Grace Harbor had requested it and there were lawmakers. And then, so it was a freshman lawmaker last year and they got it off the floor. They were at the house, they were working on it. And they just, I thought for sure, everybody would want that bill just because they want to have one moment where they could have some fun, but that didn't pass. Uh, I'm not sure that I have a favorite or one that I've watched. I mean, there's some that I've been surprised at uh, become just so 
bogged down in the process. Uh, one local one, uh, Arlington, and for a bunch of years, Arlington and Marysville have had a, a tax break for uh, on the property taxes for new businesses, and they just needed to renew it. So, you know, Representative Wicks introduced it. It has some new language, but the, the goal was just, we just want to renew it. And it turned out that every Republican loved it so much they wanted to make it statewide, so that was fine. But it went to the Senate, and the Senate said, no, we can't make it available to everybody. We can only make it available to in counties with more than 400,000 people. So now it's, you know, it, I don't know that it's in jeopardy, but <laughs> it's become a fight because you've got rural counties going, well, why does it always have to be the urban counties that get stuff and we don't? And that's really part of this country's divide the last year, urban, rural. And, uh, but uh, I'm not sure that there's a, it's hard to have a fun one when they're not on the floor because you can't see them laughing. You can't see the, uh, or, you know, that a lighter bill doesn't have, you know, people just aren't inclined to get on a computer and try to make a joke. It just doesn't have, um, it doesn't resonate quite as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, and watching the the debate on open carry was interesting because you really do have um, First Amendment and Second Amendment issues being debated. And uh, coming from someplace where uh, we didn't have open carry in California, to be able to go to the state capitol and be surrounded by two thousand of your closest friends, all armed with guns on their shoulders, and feel completely initially, I must have been naive. I just said, oh. All right, open carry, nobody's going to do anything. But in the last year, we've seen, you know, it's just changed. The climate's changed. So, um, Since you've been in this position of kind of just, you know, you probably have opinions, but you're in a place where you, you can't have opinions and having opinions is kind of will skew your writing. And you see this divide between the rural and the, you know, city. What would you... I mean, you've been doing this for a while. What would you think would be like a couple of things that could really bring the the rural people, you know, kind of, I don't want to say up to speed because that would make me sound like I think there's something wrong and I don't, but what do you think could help bridge that gap? I think part of the relationship problem is that the uh, Seattle is in its own world, really, um, in this state. I mean, you, you, when you come from a place like California where you're so many more people and so many large cities, and then you come to up here where you have one city and to that degree, one county is so dominant on everything for the state and, and sets a tone. Um, and sometimes I think that's a problem. I mean, I don't know that the rural urban divide is, 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 is a great be in Snohomish County or even Island County is not really urban, but the, you know, but it's, you know, think you get that city versus country uh, tension that you do when folks are talking about sort of us in the community, in, in the rural areas, and them meaning Seattle, because they just do so much. So I, some of it is just people, but some of it is it, it, just how they get along. But it's also the people who run for office, those who decide they want to be part of public service, they're bringing those values, and that's what tends to kind of amp it up. And you, you know, so if you're running for office and you're very liberal or very conservative and you're one of those extremes and your views are you get elected, um, your communities believe you're the voice of your community. And you're, and I think that the people have to probably elect folks who are more not so extreme. I mean, in the terms of their views, uh, it's, I mean, it's kind of a, I, I, I know enough of the people to know that some folks are just not as extreme as it, as they are portrayed uh, left or right. But and sometimes I think that's just it. And, and right now, like, and I, we are all impacted by the social media and the national. There's language that lawmakers use that I, that I just I cringe. Right? I mean, when I ask someone, the, well, how's this bill going? And it's really complicated. Well, you know, it's, there used to be, we haven't had time to talk about it in our caucus and work out the details and really help un people understand what this is about. That's where it was in 2004, 2005. Now it's language like, we haven't socialized it. We're looking through it. Um, we've gone through the equity lens. We've gone through this lens. We've gone, we're looking for the, you know, and, and there's a terminology that is 
it consumes the conversation. And, uh, and I don't know that people actually know after a while what the details of the bills that they're talking about. Um, so the rural folks can't communicate with the urban because they're, they're speaking in some ways two different languages. And, um, and I, I feel like as you can see it happening, you know, really. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm from Washington and I'm like fourth generation Washington. And we're like, you know, that financial conservative social liberal, like, I mean, it didn't matter what way we voted. That's kind of how we all were that I, all the people I knew. And this divide is so interesting to me. Like, if you want to be a social liberal, you can't be a financial conservative. Like, it's such a weird thing. I'm like, wait, we've always been both. How, how is it? I, it's confusing. Well, there's, I mean, there was a uh, hearing this morning on cap and trade, which is a big carbon package. That, uh, I won't worry about the detail, but it was interesting to watch. You have the lobbyists and the leaders of some statewide environmental groups saying, we need this, it's critical. It'll, you know, and then you have what I would say are the, the grassroots environmentalists. They're, they're, maybe they're recent to the fight or they've been in the fight all along. And they're saying, no, this is a bad deal. This is sort of a corporate deal. And so now you even have within movements, you have a, sort of a, a street level voice that is different than an organizational voice. And that further confuses the matter. Uh, um, and I personally, I just put it on the ballot. California, uh, you think we have a lot of initiatives in this state, but California was great. When in doubt, you just get an initiative and the ballot would be full and then the voters could speak. And for whatever reason, a lot of these tough issues the lawmakers don't wanna put on the ballot that might be one way to start to bridge the divide by giving everybody a chance to actually vote on some of this stuff. Thank you. Anyone else got any questions for him? Hey Jerry, this is Janice Hexford. How are you? It's been I'm a long time good. since we, we haven't spoken for a long time. So it's good to see you. Um, I have a couple questions. One, you're talking to business um, owners, business leaders. You've brought up both capital gains and the um, carbon tax, which again, we've um, heard some things about, but are there any other topics specific to small business that you can see that are going to reach the light of day? I'll let you answer that one and then I've got a follow up. Yeah, I, I think the for small business, Right now, uh, this legislature, the most it's going to do is pass through the COVID money, the grant programs that are out there. Uh, and I'm not, I mean, there's two or three, some are for businesses that shut down, some are businesses that are open that are trying to stay open. Um, I think that, that'll be the most direct aid, uh, but that's going to run out. I mean, there are policies that they're talking about, you know, we just, for example, there's a liquor and cannabis board policy that allows restaurants to have uh, what is it, wine and beer deliveries at the curb. And that'll be continued, but until the pandemic ends. Um, so those would be, and the, the unemployment insurance, right? They've changed some policies. So this, uh, the taxation, uh, should those rates should not rise this year. They're passing bills to avoid a large increase next year. I think that's going to be a year to year. They're going to have to decide. Uh, I think at some point they're going to just have to make a big deposit into and re replenish the, uh, you know, the unemployment security fund that's used so the businesses don't get hit with a big tax down the road. But those are probably the three. I mean, on the flip side, I mean, there, I, I don't know all, I can't tell how quickly the impacts are, but there are passing a number of worker rights bills that could affect some business owners um, that don't, they're not going, I don't believe they're going retroactive on the ag worker overtime bill that would pay overtime mm -hmm. to agricultural workers, but uh, that was a big concern. And then uh, going forward, that'll be a, con a cost to, to farmers and ag folks. Thanks, I appreciate that. And I spend um, uh, quite a bit of time on the Eastern side of the mountains and they are very concerned about um, what you just brought up. So the second part of my question, as you and I have spoken in the past, we live in a really independent district. Um, the 44th is, is pretty free thinking. Um, 
It doesn't lend itself one way or the other. However, um, my concern is that Seattle dictates and Snohomish County tends to follow some, I'm, I'm trying to word this correctly so that I'm not like making anybody uncomfortable, but there are some things that are done in, with the city of Seattle that I see more and more our district, our area following suit. Things like the moratorium, things like um, this recent that they're gonna allow people to have uh, legal representation free of charge. Um, those are just some random uh, topics that I, I'm thinking of. But in, in your um, specific role there, thinking about where we live, where all the people on this call are living and running businesses, um, do you see that Seattle is dictating um, and that our leadership is following some of those uh, uh, some of the rulings that have gone down in King County and in C city of Seattle proper? Well, I, I think that I-5 has, um, we've seen social policies and, and we've seen policies work their way up I-5. Edmonds is a good stopping point for many of them. Uh, they just did the hazard pay. Uh, and, and so they, that's a good, that's a one spot where you see it probably most directly. Um, but more broadly, um, <clears throat> you, you know, the makeup, you've got, you know, the, the Democrat Republican makeup of the Snohomish County Council and the executive, uh, you know, they do like the policies that are coming out of both Seattle and King County. And there is a, and there is some following of that uh, and if you will adopting of those ideas and i will although i don't know that's going to go forever i mean we get back to the urban rural i mean it will be interesting if at some point south snohomish county can find a candidate to run for office that's not a democrat or not a liberal democrat so that might swing things quite a bit but yeah i think uh, snohomish county is influenced by that i mean everybody's influenced because if it works in a city like Seattle or if it can work in a city like Bellevue or King County, um, then other counties, it makes sense for them to try to do that. Because uh, if, it, if it fits their politics, Pierce County is out there a little bit, right? They have a different leadership and they aren't following quite as often, but the city of Tacoma is. So I don't know, that really answers the question. It's hard to predict because my sense of the politics and I'll just make a prediction. I know this is being recorded so you can find this later, but if Nate Naring isn't the county executive, the next go around, it'll be the time after that. And, uh, you know, we will see, uh, you know, I mean, I think he's a rising star in the county council. Um, I know he, and he may not be from this district, from Lake Stevens area, but I think he may represent even more than the other Republican, Sam Lowe, he may represent a voice and an approach that is, uh, you know, will work in Snohomish County and, uh, and, and for a while, if he gets there. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to ask because I, I, uh, I have it down as one of my notes here. So the transportation package uh, that is still working through or has it gone through? Oh, no, it's, it's, you know, it's just pulled out of the driveway. Oh, okay, uh, good deal. <laughs> at, at this hour, they were uh, adding and subtracting which fees, for example, there's a, they're amending it. I think they, the original proposal two days ago had a fee on Uber drivers and DoorDash and they're taking that off. Uh, and it's a project, but you know, if, if it gets through, it would have the US2 trestle, of course, and because uh, Senator Steve Hawks from Lake Stevens is really the architect of this plan at this point. Um, but it's got a lot of naysayers and um, it is, uh, you know, it's got a lot of folks that want to see more spent and less fees. And, and what's interesting is the one name I haven't said, so I better say it now, is there's a guy, Governor Jay Inslee, has been extremely quiet other than COVID and climate change. We haven't heard much of him. He's, uh, but he's apparently behind a transportation package. And if the governor is on board with getting something done, 
that hasn't been or happened for a while, so we'll see. Um, well, it should get done, but yeah, that's a next 11 days. <laughs> it's, uh, it's coming down to the end, that's for sure. So, so um, I'm gonna, you kind of you kind of touched on it earlier, but I just, uh, if there's nobody, nobody else has any other questions, I'll just have you kind of uh, give us a, a, what do you expect for sure to come out before the end of the session? And what do you think is gonna get pushed off either in a special session or just, you know, not, not get, not see the light of day, not make it through and get passed? Well, I think we're gonna see something related to that Blake decision because um, Marysville and Mill Creek are among the cities that are adopting their own laws that makes criminal possession a crime again, just simple drug possession. If no one's been busted for drug possession, um, which I'm one of those, uh, it took me a while to understand simple. If you're walking around and, and the cop sees you, stops you and you had heroin in your pocket and they find it, they could arrest you and give you a felony under the old law, even whether you knew it or there was, you weren't doing anything with criminal intent. Now you can walk around and you could you know, you can play catch with uh, your packets of drugs with your friends and you couldn't get busted because uh, just having it isn't a crime. You've got to have some intent to do something criminal with it. So Mill Creek and Marysville, other cities and counties are doing it. The lawmakers are getting really nervous about having, you know, a hundred different approaches. So they want to do something, but they can't agree on it. But I do think they'll do something there. Um, I don't want to make a prediction on this transportation package, climate change. They want it. Everybody said in the left side of the aisle, the Democrats and the governor wanted. Um, I think they'll need special session to get something done on that. Cool. Excellent. Any other questions for Jerry while we have him here? Jerry, is there any question that I should have asked you that I haven't asked you yet? <laughs> No, I, I don't think so because uh, I mean, I have to say I feel bad because I, you know, we're in the weeds down here and this year is unusual. My not being able to walk out, I don't have a lot of good insights and gossip about different lawmakers. Uh, and usually we do. We usually do get a few good stories, um, a few good moments of embarrassing moments. Uh, you know, there's things that go on. The Speaker of the House, Lori Jenkins, is an incredibly interesting woman. Her thing is socks. And they used to have, you know, they, she'd wear socks and then people would wear these strange socks on the floor because the Speaker would say, okay, what are you guys wearing today? We don't get that this year. And I'm, I think that kind of is part of why that uh, it just, you miss that. And that's what gives a character for the sessions. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Smolin put a couple of comments in the chat box for everybody a moment that the Forward Washington is an executive uh, session right now as we speak. Um, and that Senate Transportation is discussing amendments at the moment. Um, they have three bills that make up the package uh, if they have time, she says. So the floor is supposed to start at 1 p.m. So not sure that'll happen, what will happen next. So one step at a time, she says. So thanks, Jennifer, for putting that in the chat. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Good information there, so um, yeah. Any last minute questions for Jerry before we send him on his way so we can make that, uh, <laughs> make his next session he's got to catch up to, right? <laughs> uh, excellent, all right. Well, thank you again, Jerry, for being here. We appreciate you uh, taking the time to, uh, out of your, the busy schedule as we get near the end of the session to come in and uh, give us a little rundown on what's what's been happening and what we can expect to see over the last 11 days. Oh. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Excellent. Okay. As uh, we head out here, I want a couple of last minute things um, before we go. First off, I want to remind you that I still have safe, uh, safe start kits from uh, the for small businesses that were put together by the Snohomish County Department of Ener uh, Emergency Management. Uh, if you are interested in getting one of these, um, chamber member or not, uh, please give me a call. Uh, email me at my email address. And again, that's director at lakestevenschamber.com or give me a call here at the office. These kits are free and they're included in the items that you see here on the screen. Uh, a couple of bottles of hand sanitizer, a couple of packages of gloves, both reusable and disposable gloves, or excuse me, masks, as well as that thermal, uh, th um, um, thermometer, infrared thermometer. 
Uh, those are all included in the box and I can even deliver it to you. So <laughs> give me a call if you're interested in that. Um, once again, say thank you to our 2021 Silver Investors, Wells Fargo, Waste Management, Heritage Bank, First Financial Northwest Bank, and our newest Silver Investor, Marysville Toyota. And our Gold Investors, once again, Community Transit, and Ace Hardware at Lake Stevens. Thank you again, Jerry, Jerry Cornfield, for being here with us today. Thank you all for being here, asking questions, and being involved in your chamber. I uh, look forward to seeing you again. A reminder, uh, a couple of things next week. We have uh, Networking After Hours the week after that. Morning Mingle, hope you can join us for those networking events. Next month is the Leadership Breakfast. So that will be on the same second Wednesday of the month, but it'll be a breakfast time. Uh, still looking at start time of that. I think it's gonna be 7.30 or eight o'clock. Um, and we have um, the CEO of the Association of Washington Businesses, Chris Johnson is gonna be with us to uh, talk to us about uh, leadership in business uh, here in the state of Washington. I'm super excited about that as well. Again, thanks, Jerry, for being here. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And um, everybody have a fantastic rest of your week. Enjoy the warm weather out there. It's going to be nice this weekend out here. So enjoy that and take care.